In Greek mythology, Hercules in his 12 labors is one of the most well-known and popular myths to have ever existed. As the story goes, Hera, the queen of the gods, was not super happy about the fact that her husband Zeus was having so many extramarital affairs leading to a bunch of little demigod babies roaming around the earth. One of these babies was named Hercules, and Hera hated him with a burning vengeance. Later on in his life, when Hercules became an adult, Hera drove him to such insanity one day that he killed his wife and all of his children, pretty much taking away everything he loved. And after speaking to the oracle, looking for some sort of guidance and feeling guilty, Hercules was sent to serve the king Eurystheus for 10 years as punishment for his actions. During this time, he was given his famous 12 flavors, which were were supposed to be impossible tasks designed to kill the demigod, but Hercules persevered and completed every single one, and in doing so, earned his forgiveness and his immortal spot as one of the greatest Greek heroes to have ever lived. But we're not really here to talk about Hercules, I want to talk specifically about his 11th labor, which was the impossible task to bring back a golden apple to the king. Now, these golden apples grew on a tree located in the garden of the Hesperides, and this tree was a wedding gift from the goddess Gia, Mother Earth herself, to Hera in celebration of her marriage to Zeus. Wanting to keep it safe and protected, she posted the mighty dragon of Leiden at the stump of the tree to guard the precious fruit. But Hercules was prepared to face such a beast and killed Leiden with a poisonous arrow. Now I think we can all agree that Leiden was the innocent victim in all of this because he was perfectly fine guarding his apples and I think Hera felt the same way and to be honest probably feeling a little bit guilty because she practically sent his murderer after him and in her sorrow she threw him up into the sky where he would live on and be remembered for all eternity. And that, supposedly, is how we got the constellation Draco. Hello internet, my name is Abby, and welcome to my channel. Let's do some amateur astronomy. So in today's video, we're going to be talking all about the Draco constellation. I'm going to be covering things like how to find him in the night sky, we'll go through each one of its stars, and we'll discuss interesting facts about each one. We'll talk about other celestial bodies within the constellation itself, we'll talk a little bit about the history of the constellation, and we'll end things off where we started and we'll talk about the different myths that led to Draco being who he is. So first let's talk about how to find Draco in the night sky. What you're going to want to know is Draco is actually a circumpolar constellation, which means if you're in the northern hemisphere like me, he's always out. It doesn't matter what time of year it is. Actually, throughout the year, he will circle the North Star. And to find Polaris, what you're going to want to do is face directly north and draw a straight line up into the sky. And you'll see a relatively bright star. It'll be one of the first ones you hit. That'll be Polaris. And you know you've got the right star when, once you found it, you can see it is the end of the pan of the Little Dipper, or Ursa Minor. Once you found the North Star and the Little Dipper, the next thing you're going to want to do is find the Big Dipper. And the Big Dipper is always somewhere around <laughs> next to the Little Dipper. Um, in this case, it's right above. And the Big Dipper is, again, in the very similar shape of the Little Dipper, so it's pretty easy to spot, especially these three handle stars. Um, and all these stars are relatively bright. Again, more details in my last video, but you know you found the Big Dipper when these two end pan stars point towards Polaris, the North Star. In order to find Draco, pretty much what you need to know is that the tail lies between these two asterisms. Um, so again, th this imaginary line between these two end pan stars and Polaris, there's this orangey star right here that's more towards the Big Dipper, but almost along that line, that is going to be your Lambda Draconis. That is the very tail star of Draco. And then from there, you can follow this pattern of pretty dim stars, but they're relatively bright compared to the space around them. And you just kind of have to know the shape of Draco. So Draco, once you found the tail, heads towards the pan of the Little Dipper and wraps around and comes all the way out to here, which is not quite as far as the North Star, but at least towards the handle. And then wraps back around and ends 
at these four stars right here. These four stars will make up the head of Draco. These ones are pretty easy to spot. Out of all of the constellation Draco, this is the easiest part to pick out. So once you have found the tip of the tail and the head, you can sort of snake your way around the Little Dipper, and that's when you know you found Draco. So Draco is a fairly faint constellation. You're going to want to make sure you have fairly dark skies if you're going to want to pick him out. Hopefully that helps you find him in the night sky. Draco is the 8th largest constellation in our sky, sitting at 1,083 square degrees. I'm going to put up a picture. Here's the official Draco star chart from the International Astronomical Union. And as you can see, there's a ton of stars that actually make up this constellation. Every dot on this map with a Greek letter is an official star of Draco. And I'm going to go through some of these stars but i'm not going to go through every single one labeled on this map because we would be here for an hour and it'd be a very boring video but i'm going to go through the ones that actually make up the outline of the snake so as you probably noticed all of these stars are named with the greek alphabet letter um, they also have a more colloquial name to them but i will probably be using the greek alphabet name as i go through these just because i am terrible at pronouncing thing, especially a lot of these names are Arabic and it'll be just, I don't want to make your ears bleed. I might go back and forth between some of the colloquial ones and some of the Greek ones, but I'll be mostly sticking to the Greek letter name. Anyways, like I said, I have 15 on my list. We'll go through them. I'll talk about interesting facts along the way, but this might be a long section of the video. So grab some water, grab a snack, sit tight, and let's talk about some stars. Okay, so we'll start with the very tail. So this star is called Lambda Draconis. It is a solitary red giant star. It's 1.7 solar masses. It's classified as an M03-3 A CA1 star. It is 334 light years away with an apparent magnitude of 4.1. Up next, we have Kappa Draconis, which is a blue giant star with a classification of B63e. It has a visual magnitude of 3.82, so it's slightly brighter than Lambda Draconis, and it is 490 light years away. It is five times the mass of our sun, 1400 times the sun luminosity, and interesting, it might be entering its red giant stage because the core of the star might be running out of hydrogen. From the years 1793 to 1000 BCE, this was actually the closest star to the Earth's celestial North Pole, but it was never really considered the North Star by people because there's a nearby star called Kochab that is much brighter and people just, I guess it was easier for people to pick out. Up next, star number three. Again, shameless plug to my last video because I, I talk a lot about the cultural significance of this star. This is Alpha Draconis and Thuban, which is its more official name, is actually derived from an Arabic word meaning large snake. It has an apparent magnitude of 3.6452. It is a white giant with a classification of A03. It is 303 light years away. It has 250 times the sun's luminosity and from the years 3942 to 1793 BCE it was considered the North Pole star in the time of the Egyptians. Um, so this is actually a double star which means that it has a dwarf companion it's either going to be a red or a white dwarf with a 51 day orbital period. Star number four is Iota Draconis with a visual magnitude of 3.29, it is a K23 giant star. It's about 101.2 light years away, with 12 times our sun's radius, 55 times their sun's luminosity, and gives off more of an orange hue. Interesting about this star is there's actually an exoplanet around this star. So an exoplanet refers to any planet that resides outside of our solar system. This planet's name is Hypatia. Hypatia? Um, it was officially named in 2015, and I believe the story is a student with the name Hypatia submitted her entry to name it Hypatia, but it's also the name of a famous Greek astronomer slash mathematician slash philosopher. So 
that's more so how we got there. This planet was actually first discovered in 2002 and is 11.67 times the mass of Jupiter. So this is actually the first planet ever discovered to orbit a giant type star. I did do have a note here that in 2021, there was some evidence that there might be a second planet orbiting this star or maybe a brown dwarf star. I don't know too much about that and I don't have a whole lot of knowledge around that if that's true. All right, star number five is Theta Draconis. So Theta Draconis is a yellow-white main sequence star with a classification of F95. It is 68.6 light years away and is actually drifting closer to us, ever so slightly, at eight kilometers a second. It is 21% more massive than our sun with 2.5 times the sun's radius, it is 8.7 times the sun's luminosity, and has a visual magnitude of 4.12. The star is actually a spectroscopic binary. Actually, a lot of the stars within this constellation are binary stars. This is just one of them, which just means it has a companion star that is tied to its orbit. In this case, it's a dwarf star with a classification of M2. Um, these two stars have an orbital period of 3.07 days. So up next we have Eta Draconis. Eta Draconis is the second brightest star in Draco with an apparent magnitude of 2.73. It is 2.5 times the sun's mass and it is a yellow evolved giant star with a classification of G83. Eta Draconis is 92.1 light years away. It is 550 million years old, 60 times our sun's luminosity, and is also a binary. So it has a main sequence star companion in the classification of K25 with a visual magnitude of 8.8. .8. So this companion star is very dim. The physical distance between these two stars is 140 astro units, um, and their orbital period is at minimum a millennium. So star number seven is Zeta Draconis. The traditional name for both Eta Draconis and Zeta Draconis is actually derived from an Arabic word that roughly translates into two wolves. So this star is actually the North Pole of Jupiter and it has an apparent magnitude of 3.17. So it's fairly bright. It is a B63 giant star. It is 330 light years away. It is 2.5 times the size but 3.5 times the mass of our sun with a luminosity that is 148 times that of our suns. Um, this star is actually mentioned in some Hindu texts as the celestial goddess Tara. Number eight, we have Phi Draconis. It has an apparent magnitude of 4.2. It is 300 light years away, and this is actually a triple star system. There's an inner pair of stars that's locked in a 128 day orbit, and there's one outer star um, circling around those two inner ones with a 307.8 year period. Um, Phi Draconis A is a B8 spectral class star. Up next we have Chi Draconis. Chi Draconis is another spectroscopic binary with a magnitude of 3.57. One of the stars is more of a yellow white color with the classification of F75 and the other one is orange with a classification of K05. That second one has a visual magnitude of 5.67 with the main one having a magnitude of 3.57. These two stars have an orbital period of 280.5 five days um, with an average separation of just under one single astro unit. These two stars are actually so close that any sort of exoplanet that might be within the habitable zone would actually be disrupted by the orbits of these stars. This system is actually pretty close at 26.3 light years away. So for star number 10, we have Delta Draconis. And this is actually the North Pole star of Ceres. And if you don't know what Ceres is, it's a dwarf planet that is within our solar system and it lies within the Astro Belt. It's like, it's fairly well known and highly researched. So this star has an apparent magnitude of 3.07. It is a G93 yellow giant. It is 97.4 light years away and 800 million years old, with putting out roughly 59 times our sun's luminosity. 
Star number 11, Epsilon Draconis. Epsilon Draconis is a G83 yellow giant star. It is 148 light years away with a visual magnitude of about four. It is 500 million years old, so it's fairly young and produces about 60 times our sun's luminosity. It has a 420 day revolution and it does have a companion. So it is a binary system with an orange dwarf with a classification of K5 that has a visual magnitude of 7.3. So we're finally moving into the stars that make up the head of the dragon. And the first one I want to talk about is Grumium. Uh, this name roughly translates from Latin meaning the snout. Um, and it's called this because Ptolemy, when he was taking note and describing the star within this constellation, called this the jawbone of the dragon. It has an apparent magnitude of 3.75, it is classified as a K23 star, and it is 112.5 light years away. Number 13, we have New Draconis, also known as Kuma. It has an apparent magnitude of 4.13 and is a, is a multi-star system. So the first part of the star referred to as V1. V1 is a hydrogen fusing dwarf. It's also considered a metallic line star. I don't know too much about the star classification. I kind of want to dig deeper into it because I've never heard of this until doing this research. But basically it has just abnormal levels of different metals within the star. So it has a weird classification of K, A3, H, F0, M, F0. And that just means based on whatever method you are using to classify the star, you might get a different value. It could be A3, it could be F0. The second part of New Draconis is a spectroscopic binary and it has a classification together as A4. So the primary star in this binary part is also a metallic line star and the second star is a low mass, low luminosity star. Um, both of these are only separated by 0.27 astronomical units and has a 38.6 day orbit. I have a note in here that this second star is only inferred based on the orbit of the primary star. Um, I don't know if anyone's actually seen this star, like through a telescope. One of the last stars we're gonna talk about is Beta Draconis. The more colloquial name, Rastaban, is derived from an Arabic word meaning the head of the serpent slash dragon, so it's very fitting. It is the third brightest star in this constellation with an apparent magnitude of 2.79. It is 380 light years away, 40 times our sun's radius, with six times the mass of our sun. It is 950 times our sun's luminosity, and it's considered a yellow giant star with the classification of G21b-2a. It is 67 million years old, and again, it is a binary star system, so it does have a dwarf star companion, but these two really only orbit once in a millennia. And finally, but last but certainly not least, is the brightest star in this constellation called Gamma Dracon. Its more colloquial name is Arabic, and it's derived from a word meaning the great serpent. It has an apparent magnitude of 2.2. It is 154.3 light years away, and it is an evolved giant class star with the classification of K53. It is 471 times our sun's luminosity. It has 72% more mass than our sun, and also has a companion, uh, a red dwarf with a visual magnitude of 13.4. While the star is the brightest in Draco, it is certainly not the brightest in our night sky, but in about 1.5 million years, it'll actually be really close. It'll be about 28 light years away, and at that time, it'll be about as bright as Vega, so it will be the brightest star in our sky. So other than the stars that make up the shape of the dragon itself, anything within this region of the sky is actually considered to be within the constellation Draco. And this consists of a lot of different celestial objects that are interesting to talk about. One of the most famous is the Cat's Eye Planetary Nebula, which looks like this. It was discovered by William Herschel in February of 1786, and it is about 3,000 light years away. I mean, just look at how beautiful it is. It is stunning. 
This is probably one of the prettiest pictures I've ever seen. So while planetary nebulas aren't really rare, a morphology that looks like this is actually very rare. This probably has one of the most complex morphologies that you can get. So a nebula is when a red giant star is at its end of life and sheds off its outer layers of atmosphere into layers of ionized gas plumes that kind of just drift off into space and based on temperature and composition and I'm sure I'm missing something else it gives it its distinct colors and shapes and direction so the Draco constellation actually has a namesake galaxy so the Draco Dwarf Galaxy. This is a spheroidal galaxy that's actually part of our Milky Way's local group, which is interesting. So it's 260,000 light years away. It's very faint. You're probably not gonna be able to see it. No, you're not gonna be able to see it with your naked eye because it, because it has a parent magnitude of 10.9. And I have in my notes here that it's recently been a subject to dark matter research because it has a really high ratio of mass to luminosity. So there's a ton of mass in there, but it's not bright at all, which is an indicator that there might be a ton of dark matter in that galaxy, which is kind of cool. So Draco actually has a messier object within its regions. It has M102, also known as the Spindle Galaxy. This is a lenticular galaxy, which is a hybrid of a spiral and an elliptical galaxy, but we see it almost directly on its side, which is what gives it its distinctive spindle, really thin shape. It also has beautiful spectacular images taken by the Hubble telescope, and it is much further away than Draco Dwarf Galaxy at 50 million light years away. There's a third galaxy I want to talk about, and it's called the Tadpole Galaxy. It is called a Disrupted Barred Spiraled Galaxy. It's about 420 million light years away. It's also very, very, very faint, so it only has an apparent magnitude of 14.4. So you're really only going to be able to see it from the Hubble telescope. <laughs> but what's really interesting about this galaxy is that you can see it has the main body of the galaxy that looks kind of like a spiral or elliptical, but has this really long tail that's about 280,000 light years long that was thought to have formed about 100 million years ago when a smaller galaxy merged with the original bigger galaxy. And that's why it's called the Tadpole Galaxy. You can see it's in the shape of a tadpole. <laughs> So Draco also has a meteor shower. It's in October and it's called the Draconid. It's thought to be made by Comet 21P Gia... Gia. Okay, I'm not gonna be able to pronounce that name. It's on the screen. And it has a peak meteor rate of 10 meteors per hour. So let's shift gears a little bit and talk about the history of Draco. Stories of this constellation you can find across almost every ancient civilization and it pretty much starts back around 6,000 years ago in the time of the Babylonians when it's they consider this constellation to be Tiamat. Moving forward about 2,000 years is when Draco popped up in the Greek and Roman mythology. So for instance, the myth, the intro to this video, that's when that popped up. Um, so as you can imagine, this I mean, this is a pretty staple constellation. It was actually one of Ptolemy's 48 original constellation, which he noted down in the second century. And Ptolemy's constellations were pretty much standard practice. The next several centuries. So in more recent times, actually in 2011, there was a planet discovered called Kepler 10b, which is actually the first ever discovered rocky exoplanet. It was located right in Draco. It was located on the star Kepler 10. All right, to finish this video right where we started, let's talk about the different myths that surround this dragon. And I'm not gonna be able to cover all of them. I'm sure I have missed a, a bunch, but I just wanna touch on some of the mo most common ones. So the earliest myth, like I mentioned a little bit earlier, was in the ancient Babylonian times, where they thought that this dragon in the sky was the goddess Tiamat, which is a primordial goddess of the sea. And as the myth goes, that she actually turned herself into a dragon and strong winds blew into her mouth which split her in two and that's how you get the sky and the sea but the dragon still lives on in the night sky other than that there's a ton of myths within greek and roman mythology that involve a dragon and i've seen different sources claim that pretty much 
any myth that involves a dragon is how we got Draco. One of the more earlier ones is in the Battle of the Titans, Draco attacked Athena and Athena grabbed him and threw him up into the sky. A little bit later on, instead of Draco being Ladin, perhaps Draco was the dragon guarding the Golden Fleece from Jason and the Argonauts story, or the one that was killed by King Camdus of Thebes. So there's a ton of different stories of how Draco came to be. None of them are right, none of them are wrong, they're all equally valid, and I know that I missed the name. But that's all I have for you, that's all I have to say about Draco. Overall, pretty solid. I give it an official rating of 8 out of 10 stars. He's very cool, he's very interesting, has some very cool stars and objects, but he's very faint and he's kind of hard to pick out in the night sky, so I gotta dock him a couple points. But in the end, he was a cool constellation to learn about and study. Um, so if you know anything interesting that I didn't talk about, please let me know in the comments below. Or if I got anything wrong, or if there's something that you wish I added, please let me know. I still don't really know what I'm doing, my current idea is just to learn something new about astronomy and package it up in a fun video and share it with you guys. Anyways, if you made it to the end, thank you so much for watching. I appreciate it. Maybe you think about giving this video a like and subscribe. If not, no pressure. Thanks for being here anyways. Bye.